It's not every day you get to rewrite the story of human history. When German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt took a closer look at what had seemed to be nothing more than a medieval burial ground in 1994, he quickly realized it was something quite a bit more significant. For more than a decade, Schmidt would work to bring to light the mysteries of this staggeringly important archaeological site. Efforts by German and international teams have uncovered enormous upright T-shaped stones and intricate carvings which have been dated to a time before human agriculture or even human written language. To this day, only an estimated 5% of the complex has been excavated and much more of it lays underground where it seems that the builders may have intentionally buried it for unknown reasons. What was the significance of these stones that would have taken 500 people to move? Was it a place of worship, a primitive observatory, or perhaps the site of the world's first death cult? This case file, the theorists take a Neolithic nosedive into the game-changing monuments of Gobekli Tepe. Go bel go Gebleki Gebleki Tepe Go Becky Tepe Go Becky Tepe. Dan said, "I'm go back to your TP." I'm Zell. That's that's Dan. That was yeah. I'm Dan. Ah, off to a good start as always. The weekend record. It's been a while. Yes. Yeah, this is a, me and Dan have pulled a double header. We recorded a ATT Confidential this morning, and now we're back at it 12 hours later. Hard at work. Conspiracy all day. Conspiracies never sleep, <laughs> and neither do I. Oh, I... Space News! I've got one thing. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to... I think we talked about them overhauling the Falcon 9 and upgrading it to make the uh, second stage... Reusable. They've scrapped those plans. They are accelerating the Falcon Heavy. Right. So they're they they want to speed up work on that. So they've halted any upgrades to the Falcon Nine and are currently rushing through with some more uh big fucking rockets. The BFRs. Big fucking rockets. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the technical classification BFRs. Yeah, well, it's, I think that's what they the, what they were thinking about when they named it that. Hundred percent had to be. Uh, I don't really have anything else, really. I got something cool. It's more like right. Earth news, but Earth Earth news. <laughs> <laughs> but because we're talking about Gobekli Tepe and one of the or the most ancient site that we found so far, ancient temple or whatever they think it is. We've talked about it before about a possible comet that impacted Earth around twelve thousand years ago, and that's like the theory of like Graham Hancock and like it wiped out. It was, it was like a global killer, pretty much, caused like massive climate change and a huge ice age and all the shit. But they can never find a crater, so that like all the scholars are like, well, if there's no evidence, like it's not a, it's not a good, like it's not sound. Kurt Kajar, I don't know if, how you spell that or say that. It's a weird last name. But two years ago, he, he was flying in a helicopter over Greenland, and he noticed like a weird, uh, it looked like the ice was receding, like the, the ice field was receding or traveling into the ocean at a weird angle. It was kind of like going in like a circle. And he's like, judge, like, usually it would just flow straight down the hill. So pretty much, he's, he's been on the train like trying to prove this theory of a common impact. And an article from November 14th is pretty much saying that all the evidence is lining up, and this Hiawatha crater... In northern Greenland, it's about 31 kilometers wide, big enough to swallow Washington D.C. and would have probably caused like massive. First of all, it would have evap- like evaporated all the ice around it, instantly sending like a flood of cold water and like fresh water into the ocean, and probably tsunamis and all a whole bunch of other stuff. But that would have ch- like all that cold water in the ocean would have changed like how the the globe like distributes heat, so climate would have shifted like 
super rapidly and then all the projectile stuff in the air would cause like a nuclear winter. So pretty much that theory of Graham Hancock and all the, those other guys is pretty much coming true. Hmm. Fucking wild. Yeah, it's going to be fun to see how that develops. I'm interested. Peaks my interest. You know, there's so much stuff that we're finding because of, you know, well, climate change now. It seems to me there's stuff that <laughs> you see the ice receding and all these things. And I guarantee we're going to find some weird stuff under that ice. They think there's probably multiple impacts, but this is this is just the first one that they're pretty much confirmed now. It's just cha- it changes like all of our history pretty much. Especially if we can start proving that an advanced, advanced race of people lived before that impact. Which is what we're going to talk about a little bit here with Quebec Tepe, but that's all I got for Earth news. It's fucking cool. Look it up because this is like this is front front edge science here. Anyone else? Space news, Earth news. I don't. That's, that's... Nope. Moving on. Moving on to uh, Quebec Tepe. Why? Well, the game I changer. Mean, oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold no. up. Wait, 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 oh, wait, wait. My bad. Hold up. Jumping the gun. Um. If we fire up the X3, oh snap! It's fired up. I'm feeling pretty reedy today. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty. Re- oh, everyone's in for a treat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and we're thinking at it right now. Ghost story. Ooh, a ghost story. This is posted by Megan03. The haunting of a little girl. This story happened in 2008 in Colorado. I was currently living at my parents' house at the time, and it was the summer before moving to my college town in Greeley, My household was pretty crazy during this time period. My oldest sister, who is married to a military man, was pregnant at the time, was living with us with her two-year-old daughter while her husband was stationed overseas. My middle sister was back and forth from KC, and I think that's Kansas City, and would live with us for a couple weeks at a time while she was planning a wedding here in Colorado. I was in my room packing for school one day when I felt this strange sense of someone staring at me from the corner of my room. This present felt very intimidating. I would find myself always facing this corner of the room because I was too scared to have my back to it. Growing up, I have always been able to detect these things and I was convinced that this presence was one of a tough-built man because of how strong the spirit felt. The night before I left for school, I woke up and I couldn't lift my body. The only thing that I could move was my head. It felt as if someone was literally on top of me, preventing me to move anything. The next morning before leaving, I stepped into my mom's room to tell her that I thought something was in our house. My mom brushed this off her shoulders since she had so much stress going on, Sister being pregnant, wedding, me moving, etc. When I left my house, I had no contact with my middle sister. My middle sister, Amber, came home a couple days later to plan some last-minute wedding stuff. Her bedroom is located in our finished basement. She took a shower that day and couldn't even make it through the whole shower because she, too, felt the presence of someone watching her. She got out and brushed her teeth. Something in the back of her mind warned her not to look up in the mirror because she knew someone would be standing behind her. She then started to pack up her room when she again felt this very disturbing presence. This spirit was making itself known so strongly that Amber was too scared to even sleep in her bed that night. She ended up going to sleep upstairs with my sister Renee and her two-year-old daughter. When she got upstairs... Amber shared with Renee why she was sleeping with them that night. Renee then expressed her concern as well because her daughter had been acting weird. One day, she caught her daughter with her arms behind her back, 
like she was handcuffed, saying something like, please, please let go. Mm. And this was very out of the norm. My niece, my niece even started making demented-like faces. She would stick her hands in her mouth, pulling her cheeks apart while moving her head around. Something ne- neither of us had seen her do before. That night, Amber had a very detailing dream. She woke up in her dream in our house. She was in her bedroom downstairs. In the corner of a room sat a little girl in a white dress. As soon as Amber saw this girl, she knew this was the girl in our house. She walked up to the little girl and told her that she needed to leave our house and that she was not welcome. Amber turned around to leave, and when she did, the little girl appeared standing right in front of her. She described her as having no eyes and very curly hair. Seeing the spirit of the little girl in front of her face, it woke my sister up. In the morning, Amber went to my mom and told my mom about her dream and the things that had been happening around the house. My mom remembered what I told her and said she would call a friend of hers who is a medium to enter our house and cleanse it. The medium entered our house that night spiritually. (laughs) <laughs> she's like yeah i'm not coming but don't worry i'll, I'll be the spirit I'll, I'll project myself there yeah she called my mom the next morning and told my mom everything should be cleared <laughs> my mom then asked her if she saw who it was the lady explained to my mom that it was a little girl around the age of seven or eight she said the girl was wearing a white dress black big eyes with very frizzy hair my mom never explained to the median what Amber saw in her dream. The next day, I came home from school and everything that I had witnessed before was still there. My mom called the medium back and again, she came over. The next day, she called my mom and told her that the little girl didn't leave and that she has a very, very dark soul. She hid from her and that is why she thought she was gone. After the second time of the medium coming over, I walked into my house and the air in my house felt completely clean. You could tell from just the air in the house that this thing was gone. Everything seemed brighter and literally cleaner. So that's uh, the haunted that's little girl story. Haunted little girl. Mm. Haunted little girl with a dark soul. So they very, very, very dark really soul. <clears throat> Interesting. All right, let's, let's get into some... Gil Becky Tippy. Gil Becky Tippy. It's a damn cool place. <laughs> Super cool. Go Becky Tippy. The game changer. It is. <laughs> is, that, is it is. There's it, no way that's is no one. That is known as the game changer. That's what archaeologists call it. The game changer. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> oh fuck! I was like, that's unreal. <laughs> that's what we're calling it from now on. <laughs> Go back That's to what tappy, we're going to call it, game and changer. then archaeologists are going to call it the Game Changer. But it is a Game Changer because it's the archaeological, archaeological site rewriting our entire understanding of human history. 12,000 years old? Yeah, 11,500 about. And that, that 6,000 6, more than Stonehenge and uh-huh. Sumerian writing at, at a time when humans were supposed to be all nomadic, no... Like they had stone, no agriculture, sto- no agricultural stone tools, no wheel, like really limited technology. And like people have never like cooperated enough in the, like in a group to stay in like a, and form a city because like they weren't farming or anything. So to have this site at this point in history, pretty much re- rewriting the entire way we think about like ancient humans. So it's like, it's fucking just super cool. The actual site itself has been known by by people it's been and known about for like a long time. The people who lived around the area uh, never really saw it as much. And archaeologists knew about the site, but they actually thought that it was a medieval cemetery. They thought it was just something, nothing really out of the ordinary, nothing really to look about until there was one German archaeologist, uh, Klaus Schmidt visited the site at one point in 1994 and he realized that there was more to it than it seemed. Um, he's quoted as saying, within a minute of first seeing it, I knew I had two choices. Go away and tell nobody or spend the rest of my life working here. Oh, and he and did. 
And he has so far. Yeah. So uh, since 1994, excavation has begun on Gobekli Tepe, the area. And Gobekli Tepe is not just one, uh, one, it's almost like a city, really. Uh, it, it, the, the complex of what they believe now is a, some sort of temple of some kind um, stretches from like the original site out into other things. And they keep finding more and more like uh, once they excavate at one part, they realize that it's like, it goes even deeper. And it seems that even that the complex that is above ground, there's more below it. And it had actually been backfilled. Like it had been excavated. Then uh, parts of the temple complex have been built. And then it was buried again. Yeah. Like, so they, whoever did this, that's the craziest part. They built it and and covered it up. And the, like and that's the only reason it's preserved so well. Because they purposely backfilled whatever this is. And it's just like right now they have something like twenty of the they're like stone circles, is what this is, like stone megaliths. Kind of like a stone hinge, kind of. With like weird Yeah, you've got stones in there that weigh up to like ten tons or even more than that. Yeah, ten, twenty tons. Uh, easy some of these stones, and they're up like they're like twenty, twenty five foot stones. Standing upright. And with like with uh, there's carvings, but they're not. What's it called? It's like a carving, but it's not carved into the rock. It's carved like it's like a away from the rock. Yeah, so they they like carve the, they carve the rock around like they made that so that it would stand out from the rock rather than chiseling it in after, which I'm assuming would be way harder to do. It, it is, yeah, way fucking harder. Yeah, there's tons of carvings on them. They're uh, representations of animals. They're what they believe to be stylized humans. Um, these carvings like if you go and look at these carvings they are for, for a people that were nomadic and seem to have no what you what you would consider now culture these these carvings are incredibly complex like when you're a nomad i i would assume you're doing some sort of type of like scrimshaw or something like you, you carve stuff from bones or um carve stuff from wood things like that like small things right but yeah Somebody, a, a nomadic people who were stopping here just on and off, and you took the time to carve uh, complex images of like scorpions, uh, vultures, uh, different types of animals that were around the area at a time, and you stayed there long enough to be able to carve that out, and you took it, you know, to do that. That's, that's mind blowing. It's so far removed from its time, like time in our history, that it, like the theories are like they're boundless right now. Like who? Yeah, like, who, there's no who writing. This? Like it, this was before human. Rec- this was before recorded history, written recorded history. Exactly. So and it's what, and it's so advanced. Like it's for the time. This is unspeakable from what we know of human history. Gobekli Tepe, it's a game changer. Is what. Hundred <laughs> percent. <100%. laughs> Game changer. Case file 85, the game changer. Gobekli Tepe, the game changer. But to take, a pro- like a project of this size would take soup, like a lot of coordination. And in this case, if, if they had no technology, hundreds if not thousands of people to move these stones somehow and place them. Well, some of the, some of the like T-shaped pillars weigh around 60 tons. Yeah, and they think even with today's, even with our technology now, we'd have issues moving them. They estimated that 500 people may have managed to move and position the massive pillars. How the fuck do you get 500 people together back then, though? I don't know. That is the weirdest thing. How do you get 500 people together? And when you have a tribe, maybe like 50, 60 people, maybe, you know? Um, some people have theorized that this this area was of some sort of religious significance and it was kind of like a meeting place for um, primitive humans to meet and, you know, refresh the gene pool. Um, bang so to bang say. shack. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so um. people were kind of saying that they would meet here um, to kind of like, you know, exchange good, maybe exchange goods or, you know products whatever they made um trade stories uh things like that but throw up a 60 ton pillar yeah yeah, just throw up a 60 ton pillar at some point it's it's the fact it's not the fact that 
you know, people actually met there. We know that. It's like, why did they do this? Why would you have, if it were like 10 tribes of 50 people all come together and work to build this over a long period of time? This is not like something they put up within like 10, like a, this would be like generations of people uh, working on this, the complex of what is now like Gobekli Tepe and they keep finding more every day. Well, yeah, for sure. Cause they, they say they find some that look like they're like, they're not as proficient and they've been buried and then built on top of. So they, they say that some of these circles are, they're like trial and error. So like they'll build, they say some are built not as well as others. And some are carved way better than others. So they say, whatever this was, either the theories are whatever nomadic tribe. One of my theories is this was probably not built. This is the Graham Hancock theory. And those people is this was built by a prior advanced race before like the great deluge, like this comet that we talked about that struck Greenland and maybe other places and wiped the pretty much changed the whole climate. Because when you have stone, right? We've talked about it before that you can't really, it's hard to date the stone unless there's organic material attached to the stone or around the stone. So they're dating it to 12,000 years by something like some type of mortar, like like a paint or a mortar that they found on some of the stones and they date that to 12,000. But that doesn't mean that the stones were at the same time. So some of the, some people, some theorists theorize that these nomadic people came back like 100 or 200 years after this great event and kind of like repopulated. Same thing with like a lot of these ancient megalithic like sites. Yeah. And there, I mean, there's lots of stuff that they found or besides just the stones that they've actually found in these archaeological dig sites. Uh, some archaeologists, archaeologists have found uh, evidence of skulls there and what they kind of dubbed the, an early Neolithic skull cult. Uh, that apparently had would take the they found the remains of skulls which had been uh, that had been carved. Uh, they found these skulls that are pieces of skulls that had deep incisions that were carved uh, into the skulls using stone tools, and they made grooves in them that they say ran up from the forehead to the back of the head, and they they theorized that they had they would take these skulls and they would hang them up around the, around the temple complex. So whether those skulls were either venerated ancestors, like people who had died and, you know, this is the, the patriarch or the matriarch of the family and, you know, or they were enemies that had been dispatched. That, that's still up for debate. Right. So there's a lot of weird stuff that was going on here. Um, they found, uh, at one of the temple sites, they found these massive stone jars, uh, which were big enough to hold probably about 40 gallons of liquid. And there's no real way to be sure, but some archaeologists say that the it may have held an early type of beer. Yeah, they have. You know, so this is they say, the party yeah. spot. They say that they did, they possibly did brew some type of beer there, which is, so that's, we always thought it was, I think it was Samaria they thought was the earliest beer. Like Wrong. Wrong. 6,000 years before that, there's beer. People have been loving beer for at least 12,000 years. I'm drinking, I'm drinking beer right now. <laughs> you know, keeping the tradition alive. Keeping human tradition alive. <laughs> Look, you can pull up. I don't even know. It, this is, again, they have one of those. It's the mystery of how they also got the rocks to Gobekli Tepe. Because I'm reading that some of the rocks they figure would have to be transported in. Like some of the, these big well, transporters, yeah, transported in, and also because Gobekli Tepe was like up on a hill, right? It's like it's like yeah. twenty five hundred feet above sea level where this is, and some of the quarries and stuff weren't around there because I think they're like some people say they're like at least like you know twenty or thirty kilometers away. They had to transport some of these stones, so no stones, but no wheels, so you can't not rolling it on logs. Yeah, it's like, how did they get them there? It, this would have taken a enormous amount of like, what have, what for them would have been state of the art, but for us is primitive technology, like whether it was rolling them on logs or building dirt ramps, inclined planes, or, um, you know, just weaving rope, you know, putting together rope to use to, to drag these stones, do, do, move do, them. Do they even have rope at this time? I don't know. I mean, you wouldn't be able to find it because, you know, it's made of organic materials. Yeah, it's gone, so long gone. Obviously, it'd be pretty long gone. 
Um, so it's like, you know, how did they move these? Don't, you can't tell me just physical brute strength alone, you would move these stones. Like, okay, it's, so no, you need a little tech for sure. Yeah. So Dan, let's let's go through this here for a second. So Zell, you're the leader of the the nomads. You've rounded up in a time of great hostility between tribes and and you know real food food survival sorted. instinct food shortage. Yeah, you organized. Let's say let's give you five hundred people. You organized five hundred people to go to the fucking desert and lug around these 60 ton rocks from somewhere. Then as I'm, I'm carving out it, I'm carving an animal into mine. You go, no, no, no. I don't want you to carve in an animal. I want you to carve the rock away from the animal. I'm like, well, that's going to take twice fucking long because I got to carve way more rock. And you're like, that's what I want. (laughs) Get it done. Get it it done. done. (laughs) So then we do all of that. We set it all up. And then we're like, Hey Zell, we're done. And you go, all right, bury it. What's the area at all? <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> like you just look at his face, like all right, bury it. What? No, exactly. Like, I just don't get that. I'm like, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Well, for, first of all, the the area that they built it in might today be a desert, but back then was not a desert. Like this yeah, was like so. fertile crescent area, and it had and what most like archaeologists and paleontologists would say, like uh, an extraordinary amount of flora and fauna at the time. Like this, this was the area that was the birthplace of civilization. And they had theorized that because uh, the theory is that because it was so abundant in natural resources, like you didn't have to move as much. You could harvest wild grain. You could hunt for food because uh, this was like an area that, um, uh, was a uh, like a migratory route for the, they had like the Persian gazelle, oryx, uh, which is like a primitive version of of cattle that we have today. They're really big. They're huge. They're scary looking, but uh, deer, uh, birds. So at the time, this would have been a very uh, like a favorable place to to live, and so living there is either whether whether they stayed there because it was uh so awesome for you know for cave people for nomads to be like whether they came there from somewhere else you know so it's like did they come there from some come there from somewhere else and then decided to stay there or did they know about this place and then they figured out well okay then we can you know did they go through there every so and then and then somebody had the bright idea to be like well why don't we just stay here instead of following the animals you know so that's kind of a question that i'd like to see answered <laughs> but even with that many people man you would just you would you would have so many mouths to feed right like everything we're describing right now is not how they teach it in school at that time we're all hunter ga- hunter gatherer nomads following herds around right. no so yeah there was wild grains and you could there, there was some harvest but you didn't right. you didn't grow it it was wild and you you took right. what you took what you got pretty much yeah and the, w- the accepted theory today is that agriculture preceded culture or religion right agriculture like, led to that stuff right that, right it preceded so it came before and then gobekli tepe seems to turn that all on its head saying that people built these these temple complexes, which are obvious, I mean, they have no function, really, as as we see it. There's no real, uh, there's no real practical purpose for these. They're not irrigation canals. They're not, um, they're not traps for animals. They're not farming pens. They're nothing like that. They're just, you know, they're markers of they're something. Just art. Markers you know, of there's something. something, yeah. You know, they they represent something. They're abstract representations of whatever these people were seeing or they saw. And there's no evidence for farming. There was no evidence that these people had stayed there long enough to build uh, farms or breed animals or anything like that. These people were coming in and out of this area and adding on to and building this complex. So this this is saying. 
you know, new theories are cropping up where it's like, no, spiritualism, religion preceded agriculture. Like the people came here to this temple complex, started building this thing for some reason. We don't know why. And then, then they became sedentary. They started building cities and farming and things like that. Or Gobekli Tepe was already there. And these, no- right. and these nomads didn't actually build it. They might have added on and tried to build their own. But they, like that's, that, that's another theory that this might have been a part of a, like a pre-flood race or a plead, like a pre-disaster, like um, global killer ra- like event. It would have been like an, right. Atlantis, right? Atlantis is the lost right. civilization. Advanced civilization that was wiped out at this time by either the theories the main theory I go with is the asteroid or some people say like a giant like CME but it's it's a game changer there is yeah. there is no in order for something like this to get built you have to have a like a society with like a high, like yeah. a like a hierarchy stru- like a structure you know you have a, to have an or- economy societal organization for sure 100% you can't just be a bunch of tribes roaming around chasing wildlife yeah. as they migrate they were they were cavemen like in every sense of the word like they were what we would think of as cavemen that's what we're taught at that point at that time there until about six thousand years ago we were just running around animal skins and, and down four-legged creatures putting weird fucking stick men on walls like these are intricate carvings very difficult like that would have been very difficult to complete. And, like, the rocks are so fucking smooth. Like, the ones with the... Cl- I'm just... I don't get it. No one gets it's it. Mind-boggling. That. And that's why it's... Yeah, it's so mind-boggling. Yeah. The art that they have there... I mean, you can look at some of the... I mean, They're beginning to restore it now. Um, but they have removed some carvings and some statues from the area and put them in, in the museum. Uh, museums in the area and like you look at these things and they're so abstract like they're they're like they they have these what they think are either representations of people or or perhaps like their deities uh, gods whatever they saw them as and like they had there's a quote saying that they have no eyes no mouths no faces but they have arms and they have hands they are makers and then some of uh, they'd go ahead and one archaeologist goes, in in my opinion, the people who carved them were asking themselves the biggest questions of all, what is this universe? Why are we here? Right. You know, if you have, you know, they, like, were people thinking about these questions? Because it's always the accepted theory is that when we settled down and we started farming, we had the time to once we stopped moving and we didn't have to hunt every day, we didn't have to struggle for survival. You kind of had time to sit down and think. That's when we started asking the big questions. That's when we needed. That's when religion developed, you know. But this, this goes before that and saying that. Well, were we already thinking that? Was this already happening? Exactly. Like, every time I we talk about these ancient cultures, I always think the human brain has really been unchanged for well mainstream science and scholars will say it was 200,000 now they push it to 300,000 it might be more like 400,000 but it's probably even older than that like the pretty much the same brain power and we only have like a little snapshot of the last like really 6,000 years and now go Beckley Tepe so I I'm still I'm my theory is still that I think humans have like became civilized and intelligent and had great economies and built cities and great structures and then been wiped out by events more than once. And then just right. just this most recent one is the one that we can really that we that's as far as we can go back now. Yeah. I I mean I completely agree with that because I mean look at some of the great what you would consider great civilizations of the world. You have the people who built places like uh Angkor Wat in in Cambodia. Uh, you have the Aztecs, the Mayas, like these people built these incredibly incredible cities. They had advanced mathematics and they had advanced uh, knowledge of astronomy and, and engineering. And most of these ones, like even the Aztecs at some point experienced like uh, 
during their empire, or at least the Maya, like their well, the Aztecs got a lot of their stuff from the Mayans. And uh, uh, the Mayans, like their decline is attributed to something like a global drought. Right? Right. So, and that was just maybe like not that many, a, a couple hundred years, maybe like a hundred years. And, and if it takes that, and that, and that set the Mayans back. Like that, that, that's, you know, stalled their growth as a civilization. Like these kinds of global events, like cataclysmic events can set civilizations back. It sets the clock back. So how, what are we to say that if there was a, a civilization that is the, you know, the human brain was what it is now, you know, 300,000 years ago. Yeah. And then we were already building like how far we've come in what, like a thousand years. Like even say the last hundred years, like we've become like a whole different species. Right. Well, just like 3000 years, like recorded history starts like 3000 years ago, right? Yeah. right? Like 3000 years ago is like how far we've come in from putting down the first written word to now, you know, that's just 3000 years. If we had the same brain power as to back a global cataclysm could set your, the, you know, could set a, a 3000 year old, civilization back back to the stone age literally that is a really good point so now another theory is that Ooh. these stone these stone pillars are actually like an like an astronomical thing kind of like you know the mines they all like build their temples to like line with stars oh, yeah. at certain points in history right so researchers have they've been going around some of these pillars and they'll they put in like a fancy computer program i didn't understand exactly how they did it but they pretty much are saying right. that at this time these stones and the pillars are actually representing, like representing constellations, like Scorpion right. and like all these. Yeah. And they put a bowl similar to like all other cultures in astron, like like yeah. astronomy. They're saying that some of these could have been that. So if that's the case, then this would have to have been a very advanced race to know that much about the stars, right? Because they're saying they even knew about precession of the equinox, like the wobble of the Earth over time. Yeah, humans have been stargazing for thousands of years and we're pretty good at it like we're pretty good at noticing the changes and recording and writing things down and recording the changes in the sky which is nuts because you know i mean i don't half the time i don't even know what day it is you know yeah. like, <laughs> you go back like a thousand years they could probably look at the sun and tell you exactly what time it is uh, and what season it is and what month it is right and half of you know most of us here on earth now it's like you gotta check your phone to know what time it is, oh, what yeah. day it is. I don't have my phone or my watch on. I'm fucked. And yeah, no phone. I don't right? remember anything. No one's numbers, like nothing. Like it's gone. So we're really good at noticing that kind of stuff. I mean, back then, I mean, that's your really only source of entertainment, I suppose. Like we have TVs and stuff now, but back then it's like you looked at the night sky to be like, this is entertainment. You get, you get all the family together and be like, oh, let's watch, you know, let's watch Polaris move from there to there. Yeah, neat. Yeah, so um, so yeah, if you had a, a society that was watching the stars for let's say a, long, a like a thousand years, you became became like an advanced culture. You built this. Mm -hmm. Say now that asteroid hits or the comet hits Earth, that that civilization is because this is pretty far. Like it's away from Greenland, so it wouldn't have got hit by the blast probably, but it would have been affected by the climate change like globally. But that wouldn't have happened overnight. So maybe over like a hundred years, it took for these people to become like set back to the Stone Age, become nomadic again, and that's when the nomads like they're they're roaming around. Now they're not they're not farming or anything, but they're still they're still around this area, and they keep treat they just keep treating this area, even though they probably don't even know what the stones are anymore. They just know it was built by like their like their predecessors, and then they, they kind of just like repaint the, the pillars at this time around twelve thousand years. Because they say it's about a hundred years after the impact is when it seems like that's the organic material they're finding at this site. So it's pretty, it's probably if there's an advanced culture before the before Gobekli Tepe or before like twelve thousand years ago, it's just they're like and you know they're uh, it's the same people just they've lost the knowledge, but they're still in the same place. That's kind of why that's kind of why I think about this place. It doesn't yeah, I mean, this could have been a place that they're building as a testament to their old civilization or, you know, somehow record their knowledge and pass on their knowledge to people. Maybe they realize that this is the place that, 
you know, when they when they got there, it was a fertile place. It was a place that, you know, had a lot of natural resources. And so you could stay there for a long time without um, without having to move. So maybe this was like their effort to, to do something. But they buried it. Right. Then you buried it. So that but like, but archaeologists have, have said that maybe like this was like a common practice, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure that some archaeologists said this common practice, like you would, you'd, you know, if you found this site and you were, you know, uh, of that place that the the Middle East has a pretty, you know, fluid history. um, If these sites were deemed pagan at some point, you know, they'd backfill them in, you know, and anything that wasn't the accepted religion at the time wasn't the major religion was deemed heretical. So filling these things in would be like something that they would do. Well, no, then if, if they filled them in, because that means they would have to have been a different religion 12,000 years ago, because that's, that's why this is dated to then, because it was backfilled at that time. They think it was back, backfilled the exact same time that they're dating the car- carbon on the stones. Right, but then I think that, that goes with your theory that they, they thought that was the best way to... They were burying a time capsule. Yeah, okay, yeah, time capsule, for sure, because th- a lot of people's theories are these are astronaut astronomical markers some saying some of these stones are depicting they actually depict the the comet strike so they're right. they're pretty much saying like whoever built this for the 100 years in the 100 years decline after the impact or the event whatever it was they purposely backfilled this as a time capsule exactly to like if someone ever found it they could dig it up and try and make sense of what it is that's what that's that's probably the biggest theory that's out there right now on the because to, to be purposely backfilled like that. Um, other archaeologists have theorized that it is the Gobekli Tepe complex was built as a as a celebration of the birth of a new star, uh, like you were talking about. Um, I don't know if they're the same scientists, but they might have been this other one. They might have been other scientists who are also studying the astronomical kind of uh, alignment of Gobekli Tepe of the, of the stones and how they're, how they align to certain celestial bodies at that time. I mean, they could do that now. That's a whole, that's a whole science now, archaeoastronomy, yeah. being able to project what the night sky looked like back, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, 11,000 years ago. Um, and what they have, at least one scientist has found uh, that, some of the stones seem to align themselves to uh, Sirius, the dog star. And at that time, Sirius would have looked like the people, if they would have lived in that area, Sirius would have been, Sirius is like the fourth brightest object in the night sky, I think. I'm pretty sure fourth. Um, And it's one of the brightest celestial bodies. So, um, people would have noticed when it came up above the horizon because at that time, because of the earth's tilt and wobble and the way it rotates, they, if they, you lived in an area, you would have never seen Sirius over the horizon. But at a point of about 11,000 years ago, Sirius came up above the horizon and started going up into the sky uh, and getting brighter as it did. Right. So some archeologists theorize that, this is why they built it, and they say that some of the representations are of Sirius, or of the star. And the Sirius star and the Sirius systems also have weird connections to um, at least the Dogon tribe in Mali, Africa. Uh, they have – the Dogons kind of hold this uh, thing. You, you see them on ancient aliens all the time, that they believe that aliens came from the Sirius star system, these kind of amphibious – looking aliens came down and passed on all their knowledge or passed on some of their knowledge of like stars and um, space travel and these things like knowledge of the heavens and math. And they passed it on to the Dogon tribe. So some people are and knowledge of the solar system, how it works. Um, So Sirius, the star, you know, maybe you could draw a connection there, but it is, it is that th- they don't they're not 100 percent sure because they're still like they like we've said, they're still trying to date exactly when the structure was built. Yeah. So it's it, they say it looks pretty good, but they're still they're like just 
you know, hold on, this is just a theory. <laughs> we're like, uh, we're still trying to test it out and still figure out if, if this is the real deal. So I'm going with that. That's the, that's another theory of go back to tab, Tepe and a lot of other ancient sites is that they were built or influenced or taught to build by an alien race that had come to this planet at some time. So, I mean, that that theory take, takes hold because if you go by our current timeline, humans, we, can't, we couldn't have built this, therefore, aliens. That's pretty much the theory there, right? If we couldn't have built it, it must have been someone else. Well, that's the you know that's the ancient alien theories. It wasn't us. It was aliens. Aliens. Well, why aliens. would aliens build it out of stone? For me, I'd be like, why would you do that? It seems kind of silly. Well, if you if you were maybe maybe they build from stone because they know it lasts forever, or not forever, quite forever, but much longer than any other building material. And if you're trying to build something, say say this is built by aliens, and they built it just as a marker in time for whoever finds it. And, they, and they're like, okay, well, it has to last at least, you know, 20,000 years and we'll bury it. And we're going to mark, we'll mark it astronomically where we were. That's what all the pillars are. They backfilled it and they left. But they don't leave any clues that that was them. So it doesn't really help us, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys, if you guys built be... it, just fucking, you know, put like. Carve a so- if they had built something weirder, I would be on board of it. If we were like, you know, we found a bunch of these like crystal slabs that we don't know what they are, and they they don't they don't scratch or they don't um, they don't seem to have any deterioration or only a minimum amount of deterioration, and there's some sort of crystal lattice structure, molecular structure that looks like it holds information or something. You know, if we're yeah. something like that, I'd be like, yes, cool, aliens. But when it's just like big slabs of rock that maybe 500 people could lift, I'm still like, okay, that's still 500 people. So we could still theoretically do that. Somehow build, you know, get rope. And if they could build Stonehenge and our brains didn't change much between when we built, when we, you know, when we may have built Gobekli Tepe and built Stonehenge, I think people could have figured it out. Yeah, Gobekli Tepe to me seems very human. And the fact that it's not there's like a, there is some sites in the world that are like, holy fuck, like this is so precise and there's no way you could carve granite stone like this. Like, okay, aliens, probably. <laughs> like yeah. some sometimes some sort of technology. Some type of powered like techno like energy technology is used and has to be used in something like to drill through granite. Or like some of these other like 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 uh, in Machu Picchu, like those crazy retaining walls that are the same as like as Egypt, or in like um, what's that place, uh, Puma Pumka? Oh, Puma Punku. Puma Punku, yeah, like those type of like dovetail granite slab joints. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those are crazy. Laser, laser, laser precision. Cuttings. Yeah. yeah, and on those kind of things, I'm like aliens, possible. On this one, it's like the stones aren't precise enough. It just means this. This just means that humans became like became advanced to the point like where they could work together and create giant like large scale construction projects. Yeah, at least six thousand years, if not more, before we originally like we think right now. Yeah, which is crazy. Game changer. Yeah, super game changer. <laughs> I think it's just yeah I I I'm totally on board with the idea that humans were more advanced in the past than we give them credit for because you know if it's just a little something like uh, an extended drought or something that can set an entire civilization back you know like the Mayans uh, like the the people who lived in Angkor Wat like you build these these huge civilizations and you build these places. Maybe not at the time. They're like, this is a great place to build stuff. But then you get a drought and you're like, oh, no, we There's don't no, have any food. No water, no food. Oh, no disease, no water. And then your entire civilization crumbles just after a hundred year drought, which I mean, that's that's a long that's a long drought. And, you know, well, yeah, for sure. Because after like if you're advanced, you could probably deal with the drought, you know, four or five, six, seven years. You'd find a yeah. way 
but it would just like continue and continue and it could eventually just wear down the civilization. It it eventually fail. Yeah. So I'm down with it. That maybe there was an advanced civilization in this place and they had perhaps like there was a global cataclysm. There was that, you know, what there is now the discovery that's developing in Greenland. If there was a global cataclysm that lined up with that, then you'd be like, yes, there was a civilization that was beginning or it was advanced at that point, but then it had to fall back because you have to survive. And then it took another so 6,000 years to get to like Samaria. Right. Where either that was aliens helping them or they just eventually mm-hmm. rediscovered the knowledge that we at once had like at least 6,000 years before that. Right. And then you could probably go, if you could find the evidence, you could probably take those back. Like, you know, every six or 12,000 years throughout all of human history, there's probably civilizations. Of some type. Maybe we, maybe they didn't have power generation or cars or anything. Or maybe they did in some other form. We'll never know, but I keep thinking every like it seems like every week there's just a new discovery and they're like Listen, we thought it was a thousand years ago, but we're pushing back that to ten thousand years ago. Or it's like we just did all this LIDAR detection in Guatemala and we thought there was only a million mines there, but it turns out there's probably more like ten or twelve million. <laughs> like there's exactly so wrong until it it gets right until it's proven so wrong. And they're like, yeah, okay, we messed that up. We tried. Whoops. Whoopsies. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, just uh, order all new textbooks. Yep. Every five years, new textbooks. Boom, boom, boom. Get them out. <laughs> then charge your, your university students $600 a book. It's all a textbook scam is what it is, really. I wouldn't, it probably has something to do with that because it, it, it takes so long to go through the system. They, Global textbook scam. They know, next on ATT. They know it. Yeah, they know it's the, the material is wrong. Five years before, they're like, okay, you know what? Business plan in five years, we'll redo it. We'll do a new edition, and yes, we'll update all the stuff. But until then, like that, that one's fine for now. No big deal. Yeah, textbook publishers know the true history of the world, <laughs> and they're keeping it all secret and unveiling it piece by piece, so they can keep selling for profit. Uh, yeah, textbooks to history majors and universities, like hundred dollar textbooks, like second edition, third edition. <laughs> Fourth edition now featuring Gobekli Tepe, the game changer. Just like human. Fifth edition, we spelt Gobekli differently than the last edition. <laughs> we forgot one of those weird accents above the O on page nine. That's been fixed. Sixth yeah. edition. <laughs> yep, ex- like like we do, like humans do, exploiting the world for profit, however we can. And history is probably no mm-hmm. different in some in some regards. Uh, that's all I got for Go Back, Back to the Tepe. I just I've been reading about it lately, and it just seems like it's just such a crazy, crazy point in human history that's like it's flipping the lid on the whole thing. Yeah, it's turning history on its head. The the game changer. <laughs> the game changer. Go Back to the Tepe. The game changer. I hope people start calling it the game changer because it's really good. <laughs> it is the game changer. You, you can God, take... I'm not gonna lie. I I kind of forgot that we had said that we might do this one today, so I totally John snowed. <laughs> okay, we got lots of he stuff, buddy. Nothing. He knows nothing. I, I know nothing. Uh, yeah, you, you could take this theory even farther. Some people claim like because the Sphinx is way older than it's said to be, and they think the Sphinx is around the same age, and they think that it could have been a civilization that actually spanned like the whole like that whole region. And if they have, if they did backfill a bunch of different things, maybe we just haven't un- like unearthed the next thing. No, no proof on that one oh, yet. Yeah. Pe- people are talking about yeah. it though, because obviously the Sphinx is now uh, geologically proven to be way older than the pyramids. But in Egyptology, the Sphinx came after the Great Pyramids. So you know, it'd be wild. We find like an ancient art. Someone digs up something in Canada or something. And they're like, what? How is this even here? Someone, ba- someone backfilled a pyramid or something. It looks like a yeah. mountain, but it's really just a really like a super advanced <laughs> old pyramid. Fucking pyramid. Northern Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> Saskatchewan. <laughs> they're all descendants of the uh, the first race. <laughs> the real, Anyways, the get alien, aliens first landed in Canada. And they did such a good job of covering, covering their tracks. We just don't know. That's why you guys are so weird. We have there's no new five star reviews. So if you're listening to this, get on there, give us a five star review. 
What the shit? Oh, it's super sad. I guess our reviews have job. petered out on uh, Apple iTunes. Review us on Facebook too, but it really helps if you go on iTunes and uh, give us a review. Uh, you don't have to give us a five star review, but that really helps. Not on iTunes. Uh, I think Google gives us reviews too. They show up on Google too. Yeah, and review us everywhere. Review us everywhere. Send us reviews. We like hearing about how good we are. <laughs> or bad. Or bad. We, we we value feedback. That's the important thing. We do value feedback. We don't read one-star reviews on the air anymore, so don't think you're going to get free free publicity if you do it. Yeah, one-star reviews uh, make us laugh. <laughs> they make us laugh. Zell, do you have a, do you have a prolapse of the week? Zell's prolapse of the week. This guy's a legend. Prolapser. This week is going out to Josh Thorpe from Wild Rose Brewery in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Earth. He sent us 30. I don't know. It might have been more than 30. I, I didn't actually count exactly. Is it Calgary, Canada, Earth? Yeah, Earth. You got, <laughs> Is there another Calgary, Canada, and Mars? You don't know. We don't, you don't know. Our bases? You've ever been to Mars? <laughs> no. Could it be a different uh, solar exactly. system. You know how many fucking stars are out there? <laughs> just to be sure, just to be just sure. For like, in, a, in like 200 years when this podcast is being played on like some type of interdimensional ship, make sure they know who Josh Thorpe oh, was okay. and where he so, came yeah. from. All right. When we go into intergalactic archives. Yeah, exactly. We'll know exactly where it came from. That's why I put Earth on all everything I do, just in case. Anyways, Josh Thorpe, prolapse of the week. Thank you for the beers. I'm crushing a high harvest right now, and they're actually delicious. Thanks, Josh. Hmm. Um, <sighs> listen to that refreshment. Refreshing. We got some new Patreon supporters. Ooh, do we? We're getting well, closer. To we our, do. Getting closer to our goal of th- if we get to three hundred supporters, the show was going to take a huge leap forward. Yeah, dude. Huge leap forward. Stuff. We're gonna try and do some live stuff. And, Meaning uh, live, and live and- online streaming and. Live, oh my God! Live in, live in person. That's crazy. Power hours, wherever we can, if we can. If we if we get to three hundred, we are really going to consider. I probably quit my job, even though I don't I don't work a lot right now anyway. But I'll I'll fu- I'll, <laughs> I'll fully go. I probably I'll fully commit. I probably couldn't I probably couldn't quit at three hundred, but well, maybe I, that'll be one of the goals. Three hundred, like I future. won't I won't I won't really be able to quit financially, but I'll just quit anyway. And just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, we got new pledge, new Patreon supporters: Corey Mills, yeah. Tyson, Shannon Tyson. K. Bowers. Thanks, Shannon K. Bauer. Seraphim. 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 Reverend Seth F. K. Wisconsin correspondent. Oh yeah. Oh hey, that's uh, Jacob. Reverend. I always like to have the support of that the guy. Energy. That guy, Seth. That's the guy. That's the skydiver who got a a jersey with our logo on it. Oh, oh really? That was super cool. That was cool. Yeah. Jacob Cable. Fuck yeah. Riley Schmidt. Aria Abrego Abrego. I think that's all. Uh, all the ones thus far. All the new ones. Um, do I have anything else? We've got, still got tons of t-shirts. When is this one coming out, Zell? Is this one coming out? Will this one be out December? Yep. Oh, yeah. This... Okay. So, well, I wonder if I should do this. Okay. So, if this one's out December, Merry Christmas from the Alien Theorists. If you go on T Public now starting December 1st to let's go right up until Christmas Eve, we will be selling retro shirts. That means the original L Nasty t-shirt and oh, the shit. original Alien Head t-shirts uh, on What's sale. Uh, our Christmas present to you, limited time only, until Christmas. So if Christmas you like those shirts... Or Hanukkah. Or Hanukkah. If you have Hanukkah. Or Kwanzaa. But get, a, get them for your peeps. They make great gift ga- gifts for... Uh, prolapsers so go grab some shirts maybe i'll throw a couple christmas designs on there as well yeah. the alien head i know sh- there's a couple of people would want an att t-shirt on the fifth night of hanukkah <laughs> I'm pretty sure yeah those those alien head shirts have been requested a lot and we we said we were never going to do another run but we're going to do a run every once in a while just a quick one boom 
you get them, that's it. You're lucky. You got tw- you're gonna have twenty twenty four days. Twenty four days. I want to see. I'll I'm put have up to some... get one. Mine's uh, mine's getting pretty beat yeah, up there. I need yeah, one my, too. Mine's mine up. got my, shredded. My color. So that mine's... so that's three right there. There's only so <laughs> many left. <laughs> you better get on it. Um, do we have any other news? Do we have any other news? Um, any housekeeping? I'll be going to Thailand, so I might not be on the next. Ooh. I might not. Oh, that's I might miss right. a couple. I might miss a couple, but they'll still be coming. I just might not be on them. We've we've recorded a whole bunch in a row in preparation for Zell leaving, so we don't do a a big lapse. We won't we won't leave you leave you hanging. But in the new year, there'll probably be a couple case files with uh, zero Zell and a couple real case files with just the gruesome twosome. Gruesome twosome. So <laughs> look forward to that <laughs> early in the new year. <laughs> <laughs> Shit sound, <laughs> shit editing. <laughs> yeah. All the round garbage. Yeah. All the round, yeah. So if you guys like garbage, <laughs> yeah, you're in for a treat. You're in for some hot garbage. Hot garbage yeah, coming. This is like hot garbage that's been left on the side of the road in Texas <laughs> in like 100 degree heat. So that's what you're going to get. Only the best for our ATT listeners. Fuck yeah. All, All right. right. Anything else? Yeah, go listen to my band, Lucky Monkey, if you like rock and roll. That really helps us out because it's hard as an unsigned artist. First of all, just go push. If you hate, even if you hate the music, just go follow on Spotify or anywhere you stream. That's all. If you do that, it helps us. Boom. That's all I got. Dan? No, that's it. Well, as uh, we always say at the end of these things, keep those eyes on the skies. Peace. Peace.